stuff that I normally work in, I'm not normally researching what the lecture is going to be about, it's just a personal interest that came my way one day back in 1995 and it's blossomed on from there. So next slide please. I hope that's focused for you. Can you see the names on that thing? No. no. I, I can point out anyway. Turn the lights down. I thought someone was doing Yeah, I I think the lights will be. And here's the <laughs> Leonora. Someone turn them off. 
That's the sort of thing we thought we might be dealing with to start with. Next slide. The bush was just mud for about six months. We reason maybe there had been the impact and it had been infilled by water flow mud. But no, we couldn't find that either. So next please. The type of event had some similarities to uh, another incident which happened way back in the early part of the century in Siberia called the Tunguska event. And this is a diagram of the Tunguska uh, damage um, around the epicentre. Uh, a fireball, very bright light, was seen flying in. And there's various reports from many different people as to what actually happened. But looks like some very bright light flew in and exploded in an airburst and that then flattened pine trees uh, around a sort of central ground zero position. Uh, a lot of research and it looks like nothing, some kind of radiological particles ever um, hit the ground. So the airburst caused the damage and it laid pine trees down for about a 50 kilometre diameter and killed reindeer in their thousands and even killed a few human beings. This was a very major event. It was a bigger version of Evangelion Bang, as we now call the incident. Next slide. This slide shows the rather odd nature of the flight path of the Tunguska fireball. Um, the object, well, I should say fireball rather than object, I'll explain that in a moment. This was the reported flight path by some observers. Putting all the observations together, something flew that way, something flew that way, and something flew that way. But they've all ended up with a bang up there. Now there have been various explanations. Um, it was a UFO uh, which was out of control and exploded uh, with the force of a nuclear weapon. Uh, in other words, a UFO meaning an alien spaceship of some kind. That, that's my interpretation. Uh, but there is another interpretation. Next slide, please. Uh, th this, before we get on to the interpretations, this shows the um, Schumacher-Levi chain of meteorites that was on its way to Jupiter. If you remember it, a few years ago, it was all on TV. This chain of meteorites. Uh, next slide. Here's another image from a telescope of that chain. As you can see, the fragments, one after the other, all fly in the same trajectory. And the next slide, please. Here's um, Jupiter, and each of those blows is an impact location. Um, at the time when this thing impacted, it was broadcast on all the news, so probably quite a few of you saw the impact of at least one of the major fragments. Uh, this was a near infrared camera on a, a telescope. But it shows you that serious damage was done to Jupiter. Um, first impact over here, second, third, fourth. And that's as each one of those major bodies impacts on a rotating planet. And that was sort of what should have happened at um, Banjuan if the three fireballs were parts of the meteorite. And the distance apart of them would have been one for Banjuan, one in the Indian Ocean, and one in East Africa. And that didn't happen. Next one. Here's some uh, 18th century wags idea of what happens when a meteorite that's big enough hits the planet. So the idea of meteorites hitting the planet and causing problems are not as recent as the internet. They go back to the 1800s. Next please. Um, to make matters interesting, as I got into this research, I got more and more reports of strange luminous phenomena in fireballs. Uh, this is actually an artist's impression of something he saw at Kamanara. And the lower part is a fireball in flight, and the upper part is the sudden huge flash you get as the fireball, which was about a thousand meters up and flew at about, in his opinion, about six to eight hundred miles an hour. Um, flew over the horizon. The moment it gets over the horizon, there's a sudden kaleidoscope of uh, light energy. Um, now, for those of you who are interested in UFOs, I, I want to make a little statement right now that 
a UFO, an unidentified flying object, is the wrong term to use. Object implies mass. Unidentified flying luminous event is probably something better. Because it's not always absolutely certain that because you see photons and plasma in the air, there is actually a piece of mass in the middle of it. There may or may not be. And I'll go on in a moment to explain what might be going on. Next, please. Uh, this was a, someone actually captured in New South Wales, a place called Tregear, a UFO. It was, uh, this is a very good image. I actually have a video of, of its flight, but this is a close-up taken from, from a good quality video image. And it shows these strange swirls um, around the ball. Um, there was two UFOs, or possibly three, seen up at um, near Mount Newman, uh, Tom Price, one evening. And they flew at an altitude of about 200 metres at a slow speed, about that of a Cessna, at 100, 150 miles an hour. From the northwest, they flew over, right over the top of Tom Price, at the time everybody was out having their evening barbecue. Um, as one came over uh, and disappeared over the horizon, there was that big flash. People would turn, look to the west, and another one would come, and so on, up to possibly three. There is a disagreement amongst um, people from Tom Price as to whether or not there were only two or there were three, some possible walk of time associated and some effects on observation ability. But they flew low. The, the whole town of several thousand people saw them. Uh, interestingly enough, it was that very same evening that a friend of mine, the artist, was in Kalanurra when he saw his coming from the direction of Tom Price. Um, these were going slow, but as they left Tom Price, they accelerated. They got very fast and disappeared over the world very quickly. Um, as these things were seen, there were also other effects in the district. The um, powerhouse at Port Hedland uh, suffered an electrical overvoltage and went down and there were electrical phenomena, um, electric over voltages on power lines, etc., which caused problems. These were not the only sightings in this district. In fact, fireballs have been seen flying from um, approximately the northwest Cape in an easterly direction for many years, for about uh, since about not the early 1970s, in fact, there have been many of these uh, incidents seen. Next, please. Now we come to something closer to home, which many of you will have experienced. Um, in May 1995, uh, about two in the morning, I believe it was, there was a sudden loud explosion above Perth. Um, this is the size of record from Mundaring of that explosion, and the time you see up there again is Greenwich Mean Time. Thanks, please. This is a reconstruction of the this concludes part one of Harry Mason's talk, Bright Skies, which was held in Perth in 2001. Thank you for watching. My work, which includes my websites and my talks, is substantially financed by my books and by my numerology readings. Please help me to continue.